Wow, you're so gracious. <clears throat> Just let me get out my, uh, my strength. <laughs> I'd first and foremost like to thank uh, my good friend Nina for that gracious introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, elders, aunties, uncles, brothers and sisters, Allow me to introduce myself in the traditional way. My Christian name, as mentioned earlier, is Clayton Thomas Mueller, and I come from the Cree nation of Pagadoagan, which is located at about the 56th parallel on the border of Saskatchewan in Manitoba in Canada on the mouth of the Churchill River. Let me begin by, uh, you know, first introducing myself and also, you know, asking for permission in a good way to the people of this land. I'm not too sure which tribe it is. There are so many here in this territory. But to just say to the ancestors of this land that I come here as a guest, humbled in a good way, to share some of the good work that we do. And so as mentioned, I come from the Cree Nation in northern Canada. And as a young man growing up there, you know, I had a lot of opportunities, a lot of privilege to be out in the bush and to be doing wonderful things with my cousins. There's about 108 of us, I believe, at the last count. <laughs> to, to be out doing really beautiful things, to connect with our sacred mother earth, things like harvesting raspberries and blueberries and cranberries, things like walking with my great-grandfather along the trap line and collecting the rabbits that we would eat you know, and going and hunting wild chicken. And we would also spend a lot of time during these summer visits back up north, because I grew up in this city called Winnipeg. Some of you might know where it's at. But in the summertime, you know, when I got to go to our trap line and spend, do all these amazing things and connect with Mother Earth, you know, one of the coolest things that I remember is we had this beautiful beach. And it was really quite neat, eh? Because there, there was a cliff. Just try and picture it. You walk down from our cabin. You walk down from our cabin. Is this one? Yeah. You walk down from our cabin. You run down, and over here on the right, you have raspberry bushes. And over here, you've got blueberries in the field, along with a bunch of wild flowers. You walk down the trail, and our cabin's up there. And right here, there's a cliff, OK? A cliff with like a bunch of dirt. But down there is the beach on our beautiful lake. And we called that lake Jatate Lake. And as kids, we kind of, you know, we'd climb down that cliff so many times that there would be, there was a trail eventually that would go down to the beach. And it would be so neat because, I remember, we'd go wading out into the water and we'd walk out so far. We'd go farther and farther and we'd look back and we'd see our parents on the shoreline. And they would get smaller and smaller, kind of like if you were up in a skyscraper and you could see those tiny cars. And we'd just be so amazed because it would never get deep. And the bottom of that lake was this beautiful white clay, and we used to fling it at each other. Yeah. It was only until, you know, I guess like in my teenage years that I came to the understanding that that lake was not actually a lake, that it was part of a vast floodplain that had been created through the damming of the Churchill River otherwise known as the Misinipe, which is Great River in my language, by huge hydroelectric corporations for the purposes of providing cheap electricity to the urban centers in southern Canada. And that actually what we were swimming in was highly contaminated water. Because you see, when you submerge vast tracts of the boreal forest underneath water to create reservoirs for these huge power stations, you know, the natural thing that happens is they release mercury, you know? And so it was interesting. At that point in my life, I began to kind of understand that there was something horribly wrong. There was something terribly wrong, you know? I wondered in my young, pitiful mind, like the, 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 the comprehension capacity I had at that young age, how something so vast could happen. And who said that that was okay? And I knew that I needed to go on a journey to find the ability to articulate this 
wrong feeling that I had when I came to that understanding. And so I began a journey, you know, to work for our people, to try and uh, find justice. And that brought me to a, a lot of different places within the movement of our indigenous people's struggle for sovereignty and self-determination. It brought me through the front lines of organizing in the inner city of Winnipeg with our young native people doing gang intervention work and leadership development with inner city native youth to try and help them come to the understanding about why it is that we face the socioeconomic conditions that we face today in our communities. Why it is that 75% of the people in Canada's penitentiary system are First Nations. Why it is that 60% or 600, a Native woman in Canada is 600 times more likely to go to prison for a jailable offense than a non-Native woman. And the fact that they're the fastest rising demographic represented within our prison population. And the fact that, you know, there's only 30 million people in Canada, 1.8 million First Nations people, you know, and that these statistics are a reality that we face, you know, to help people kind of deal with that. And the way that we did it was through innovative decolonization approaches, using popular education, using things like hip hop and whatnot. But still, I found an issue or a problem with articulating that wrong that I was talking about. You know, when I came to realize as children what we were swimming in and what had happened to our land as a result of hydroelectric development. And that journey brought me to California, where I had the opportunity to meet my lifetime mentor and someone I have the honor of calling uncle, Tom Goldtooth, executive director of the Indigenous Environmental Network. And this time, half a decade ago, Tom Goldtooth saw something in me to be able to give me an opportunity to join the struggle for environmental justice, to be one of our representatives on the front line to work with our community people, to help them in a good way so that they could build their capacity to speak for themselves on matters that are affecting them. And so just to provide you with a little bit of context, the Indigenous Environmental Network is an environmental justice organization that is part of the broader movement for environmental justice. We're a network of about 250 indigenous communities, individuals, and organizations all throughout North America, fighting to protect the sacredness of Mother Earth from toxic contamination and corporate exploitation. And we do this through a variety of means. And the responsibilities that I have carried for the last half a decade were focused specifically on fighting against the unsustainable impacts or the, the, the disproportionate impacts of unsustainable development on our Native American and Alaska Native and First Nations people in Canada, on our homeland and our traditional way of life. And so IEM was created in 1990 by a council of elders in the Navajo community of Dilcon, Arizona, part of the larger great Navajo nation. And they called on us because of the fact that, you know, back in the, in the 1990s, we were finding that our communities were being disproportionately poisoned with toxic chemicals compared to other races. And because of our, this is because of our close relationship to the land and our subsistence cultures. We were at higher risk for exposure to all kinds of chemicals floating out there due to, of course, bioaccumulation up through the food chain because of the fact that we're eating off the land, because of the fact that we're harvesting our medicines off the land. And it's no different in regards to energy development, ladies and gentlemen. The link between unsustainable energy consumption in the Americas and the destruction and desecration of indigenous homelands and culture is undeniable. And as indigenous peoples, we reject the notion that our lands and our way of life should be sacrificed at the altar of irresponsible energy policies. Indigenous peoples, the United States and Canada and throughout the Americas have experienced systematic and repeated violations by oil, by gas, mining, and energy industries of our treaty rights 
and particularly those that protect our traditional lands. Oil and gas developments have consistently caused human rights violations and just horrific damage to our traditional territories that have sustained us for time immemorial. And the metaphor that I use to describe this injustice is if you look at two to four hundred years ago in my homeland in northern Canada in the Cree territory, you know, we had Jesuit priests coming into our communities. And they were promising a better way of life through changing the way that we communicated with our Creator. Okay? They promised a solution to the problems that we face by changing the way we communicated with our Creator and by embracing Christianity. And at that time, the linkages and the connection between church and state were inseparable. Now, in today's day, I would argue that the new religion is capitalism. And that instead of Jesuit priests in black robes, we have corporate CEOs in black suits coming into our communities. And they're promising a better way of life through changing the way we communicate with our Mother Earth by engaging and entering into the industrialization game. And so, it's a horrible, intense situation. Because as many of you know, across North America, our indigenous peoples are at the bottom rung of the economic ladder. That many of our communities carry the dubious title of poorest community, of highest suicide rates, of highest substance abuse rates, of highest unemployment rates. And corporations, and specifically corporate and government leaders, know this. And they take advantage of that. Okay? They take advantage of that by coming in with these quick fix solutions. And just to give you an example of this river of destruction that is being built on the backs of indigenous peoples here in North America, what we call Turtle Island, we'll start in Alaska. On the north slope of Alaska, the indigenous peoples have called this place home for thousands of years and have developed intricate and, and, and sophisticated, you know, living systems, you know, on this fragile ice edge ecosystem. And today, those people, such as the Gwet'chan people who subsist off the porcupine caribou herd, or the Inupiaq people who subsist off the bowhead whale and other seafaring life, they're under attack by oil and gas development that has been happening on the north slope of Alaska for the last 30 years. There is an industrial complex in Prudhoe Bay the size of Rhode Island, which emits annually more toxic waste than the entire D.C. metro area. Many of you, ladies and gentlemen, when you think about Alaska, you think about moose and you think about, you know, eagles and wilderness and like, oh, wow, it's so great, you know? I wish we could afford the ticket to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of you don't know, though, that Alaska ranks fourth on the EPA's list of most polluted states in America. And this is because of unregulated dumping of crazy toxic waste by not only the oil and gas industry in the Cook Inlet, where they're allowed to dump off their 16 offshore oil platforms, unregulated, not having to index nothing, or, and also by the U.S. military. You know, the U.S. military is the biggest polluters in the country. And so going back to the North Slope, here we have the community, the Inupiaq village of Barrow, a community of 400, a native village of 400. And 40 of those people have rare forms of cancer. The central caribou herd, the central Arctic caribou herd, in many cases is no longer edible. And we continually get stories about how the meat of those caribou that eat around the Prudhoe Bay oil, oil patches is turning yellow. And that there's all kinds of problems that come with that. And so let's move down south. There is a race by oil consortiums, one in Canada and one in the United States. I believe the one in Canada is led by Imperial Oil, and the one in the United States is led by, I believe, Shell, to build 1,700-mile pipelines, natural gas pipelines, to connect up with the tar sands that you heard talked about by our previous speaker in northern Alberta. 
Now, industry says that they're trying to get the lucrative gas deposits in the Mackenzie Valley Delta in Canada and the North Slope of Alaska down to market in America's burgeoning natural gas economy. But the reality of it is, is what they're really trying to do is they're trying to get that gas to the, to the, to the tar sands in northern Alberta. Because you see, the tar sands is the second biggest oil deposit on the planet next to Saudi Arabia. So you can bet your bottom dollar that the Bush administration and all their cronies are salivating at the mouth <laughs> as they attempt to diversify their oil uh, uh, you know, sources because of problems in the Middle East, because of problems everywhere else. They're trying to get oil from every little spot that they can, as well as let's not forget about their big brother China that's coming in in the picture too and changing up the whole geopolitical context. So we got to kind of picture this though. So what they're trying to do, just to give you an idea of the madness behind it, is they're trying to get this gas down to the tar sands so that they can rip off you know, the top layer, which happens to be pristine boreal rainforest and you know, like fresh drinking water streams, lakes and rivers. They're gonna mine 30 meters of uh, clay off the surface so that they can get down to the rich sand that the oil is mixed with, you know, hence the title tar sands. And then what they propose to do is they propose to, for every equivalent to every oil, a barrel of oil that comes from this sand, to separate that oil from the sand, they need to use four barrels of pristine drinking water, and they need to use four barrels equivalent of this natural gas that they're trying to get down in the Mackenzie Valley pipeline, in the Alaska natural gas pipeline, okay? Both pipelines have a lifespan of 25 years and carry a price tag of, you know, some, I've heard some people say conservative estimates around $7 billion, but if you incorporate the, uh, in, let's use the Mackenzie Valley as an example, if you incorporate the fact that they need to build a steel plant, you know, to produce the pipeline, you know, for, to produce the pipes for the pipeline, and if you include the fact that they have to build you know, power plants up in the Mackenzie Valley Delta, if you also include the fact that you, know, you need coal to produce steel, so they gotta you know, build a coal strip mine right in the center of the Mackenzie Valley Delta, <laughs> then the price tag jumps up to about you know, $20 billion. And if you calculate it at the current market price for you know, 1.5 gigawatt wind turbines, you could probably buy about, oh, I don't know, 12,861.6 gigawatt turbines. I'm sure there's people in the audience that'll tell you that one of those turbines will power, what, 500 or 300, 500 homes a year? So, you know, it's just absolutely insane. And so we get down to what I was talking about, the tar sands, the big thing that everybody's talking about. Well, the tar sands happens to be uh, underneath the home of the Dene Nation in northern Alberta. Uh, many of you know that the Navajo also are called the Dene, uh, forgive me to those Navos if I pronounce it wrong. <laughs> and they speak similar languages. Well, in, in Canada, we also have Diné people, okay? And they have vast territory just north of our Cree territory. And in northern Alberta, they have been living with the impacts of the tar sands development, okay? Where they, they have these trucks that are as big as, as seven houses, you know, or one of the houses up in the Berkeley Hills. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But <laughs> okay, and they got, and what they do here at this, at what, <laughs> what the Diné people have been living with though, just to give you an idea of the size, okay, of the ecological footprint of the tar sands development. Now keep in mind, they want to like double this to 10 times the current operation so that can Canada can be, become the number one producer of oil to the United States in the future, okay? This is why the whole pipeline thing. And so, what they, what, what they have done up to this point, okay, can be seen from outer space because the, the, the waste ponds that have been created, remember I told you they need to use four barrels of water to create steam to melt the oil out of the sand so that they can actually get the oil? Well, what they do with that water is they dump it in these vast slag ponds that you can see from the space station, okay? So that's, that's just to give you an idea of the current, you know, ecological footprint, and they wanna make it a lot bigger. 
And so right now, IEN has been working you know, with the Diné community of Fort Chipwayan. And this is one of the areas that we are going to begin doing annual Our Power Action Camps to build the capacity of the Diné people, you know, to be able to start to stand up against this huge, huge development where not only North American oil energy giants have their fingers in, but now also energy companies from India, from China, from all over the world are now, you know, actively engaged in this very lucrative in, you know, and, and, and destructive industry. And so, where does the tar, tar sands oil go once they separate that from, from the sand? Where, where are they going to send it? Well, one of the places that they want to send it is to another community that the Indigenous Environmental Network works with, to the community of Fort Berthold in the state of, Oklahoma, of uh, North Dakota. Okay, now the three affiliated tribes, uh, uh, Fort Berthold, currently has a proposal to, as a form of tribal economic development, um, to build an oil refinery, okay? A so-called clean fuels oil refinery. Well, I'm here to tell you, there's, <laughs> clean fuels oil refinery is the most like, ludicrous concept you've ever heard. Okay, because yeah, maybe all of you, when you put gas into your vehicles, you know, and what comes out your tailpipe might be cleaner, but clean fuels oil refinery means more crap is taken out of it at source. So it means more pollution for the community that's living adjacent to this proposed oil refinery, which just happens to be the three affiliated tribes. And so we've been working with the Fort Berthold Environmental Awareness Committee for a number of years now to try and do popular education strategies across, across the res to try and put a stop to this, uh, to this, to this idea. You know, to, to try and educate people about the real costs of living beside such a toxic facility, you know, in terms of trying to show them how, 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 how much that'll weigh up against, against the jobs that'll be created, you know, what you're actually going to pay. You know, and already the community has some of the highest cancer cluster rates because they're surrounded by coal-fired power plants, okay? And so an oil refinery is just going to, you know, make that situation a whole lot worse, and that's what we've been trying to do with them. And so I mentioned, I mentioned America's burgeoning natural gas economy, okay? Now, in many of our urban centers, it's a good thing. You know, we're seeing compressed natural gas buses. There's a lot of propaganda out there about, about you know, natural gas-fired power plants, and they burn so much cleaner than coal power plants. Heck, there's even clean coal power plants coming out. Did you hear about those? Ladies and gentlemen, there is no such thing as clean natural gas extraction. It is just as destructive as conventional oil extraction. You know, it's a byproduct of oil, okay? Landscapes get fractured, local water sources get polluted, and communities end up with a whole lot of environmental destruction and, and, and cultural, you know, destabilization as a result of these, these kinds of developments. And there sure as heck is no such thing as clean coal strip mining. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, when, we, when we're talking about, when we're talking about, you know, all of these things, like these initiatives that you're hearing about, you know, in terms of public transportation systems moving to natural gas and all of these things, uh, and we're coming up with solutions. You know, we, we're hearing a lot of buzz about the, you know, the hydrogen economy, you know, and all this stuff. Well, the reality of it is 86% of the hydrogen on the planet is produced through the burning of natural gas, okay? And most of this natural gas is coming from Native America, okay? <laughs> and so, you know, one of the things, too, that IEN has been working to do is to try and educate people about the fact, you know, and do movement building work to try and link up with other movements, okay? So that the solutions that we are coming up with don't just serve one, you know, privileged part of the population that just happens to live in the cities, okay, that we're also taking into account, you know, the fact that 35% of America's fossil fuels are exactly directly under or adjacent to Native American and Alaska Native communities. So the reality of it is all local energy production directly impacts our people's way of life. And so when we're doing things in the city, like turning on lights, like getting on the BART, you know, and doing all of these things, all of that stuff is unfortunately tied directly into an energy grid okay, that is directly or indirectly impacting our people's way of life to continue to live 
our, our traditional lifestyles, to live our substance cultures. Okay, and so you all need to think about that when you're thinking about some of these, 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 uh, these solutions that we're talking about. Got to think of the bigger picture and expand that even more. And so, you know, na natural gas is, 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 is just a scary thing. And there's another aspect to natural gas. You know, one of the things that the Federal Re Energy Regulatory Commission uh, has the, the, the power to do is to, uh, sorry, I got one minute here. <laughs> Listen, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this, and then uh, we're going to move on. Climate change and fossil fuel, the fossil fuel-based economy, are inextricably linked. The fight for climate justice, ladies and gentlemen, is directly tied to the fight for energy justice and the need for a low-carbon economy, a renewable energy economy, whatever you want to call it right now. IEN has been on the front lines for a number of years now fighting to educate our tribal leadership and to educate broader society about the fact that here in Native America, you know, we need to be on the front line of setting the trends of developing renewable energy. Failure to act on this issue of climate change, you know, what I've been telling folks is that climate change is the civil rights issue of my generation. It impacts virtually every segment of society, including those that cannot speak for themselves. And as a seven-generation warrior or a practitioner of of what many of you heard is the precautionary principle about what many of us native folks call the duh principle. <laughs> Let me leave you with this. Failure to act on these issues and failure to really look at the big picture is like committing a passive act of violence against future generations. And I'll leave you with a victory. One of the communities that we work with after more than a decade of work to stop a high-level nuclear waste dump from being sited on the Skull, Skull Valley Ghost Shoot uh, Reservation in Utah, an environmental organization celebrated a precedent-setting victory. On September 7th of this year, two federal agencies within the Department of Interior rejected plans for the private nuclear waste dump, which would have housed 44,000 tons of spent radioactive fuel on over 800 acres of tribal land. So it is possible. I encourage you to check out our website, www.ienearth.com, and I encourage you all to come to the, to the panel presentations tomorrow where our new Native Energy Organizer, Jihan Giran, who is a Navajo woman, will be speaking about our, more, our work in more detail, and you'll have an opportunity to you know, do some exchanges. Thank you very much. Ah, we go see.